and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. I am Pushpendra Mehta and my guests for today are Jack Large, editor of CTM File and Craig Jeffrey, managing partner at Strategic Treasurer. This week, we are focusing on four themes that address nine stories. And to keep us moving quickly, we'll combine some related items for briefer commentary and it will be up to you two gentlemen to help us meet the goal of brevity with depth. Our themes for this week are Economy that cover insolvencies in the UK and Turkish inflation creating distress. Payments that includes same day ACH in the US leaps with higher limits and Amex offers a small business cross border solution. Bank and payment company acquisitions that highlight plans by TD Bank to buy an investment firm and global payments picking up B2B payments company EVO for a cool US $4 billion. And finally, the last section, which is about fraud, where the UK faces the highest rate of card fraud in Europe and mobile device compromise that is on the rise, according to a major research report. Jack and Greg, let's begin our discussion with the first section that revolves around economy and central bank rates. A recent research report indicates that insolvency filings by business in the UK rose to their highest level since 2009 during the most recent quarter and it is anticipated that things will worsen before they improve. Jack, if I may ask you, do you think or do you anticipate more insolvencies in the upcoming year among UK's larger organizations, given that they are managing challenging economic times, limited capital and elevated market volatility? I don't think the larger organizations are going to suffer that much because they have quite a few buffers around their structure and the way they work. Um, but the small companies are definitely feeling it not only in the UK, but worldwide. And it's going to be an increasing problem, which will eventually escalate upwards. But at the moment, it's just at the small business companies level. Yeah, I'll, I'll just tack on to that. I mean, I think Jack's point on the uh, worldwide is, is true. There's there's some other articles that we're not uh, talking about where there's an expectation of significant increase in insolvencies and illiquid uh, situations in the US expecting that to bump up by very dramatic levels. So this is a uh, this is the gloomy clouds that are there. We're seeing some rain from it and and more is expected. More is expected. And moving from the UK to Turkey, where some of the biggest companies are coming under increasing strain and seeing their bonds enter distressed territory as soaring inflation and one of the world's most worst performing currencies impact on corporate debt levels. Craig, if I may ask you, do you expect the Turkish central bank to tighten interest rates in response to ever rising inflation? Or do you think they will stick with their ultra loose monetary course? I don't know. That's my answer. I think they're in a, they're in a tough spot. I mean, they're seeing inflation, at least on the consumer price side of 78 percent a year. We're pretty excited here in the States, about 9.1 percent, which is which is a dramatic number. And when you think about this is about eight to nine years worth of that level of inflation happening in Turkey that throws a wrench into the gears of everything they're trying to do. So this is a, this is a very difficult situation. I mean, it's hyperinflation. It's destructive. Reasonable people are going to be do, doing different things to try to account for it. Um, it's hard to stay ahead of that, that rate of inflation. The Turkish central bank is, and the government have got a strange, well, not strange, but unusual policy of just uh, supporting the exporting companies and ignoring the rest. I worry about the Turkish economy and I wonder whether the possibilities of default are starting to grow, which is a shame because it's a lovely country. 
I couldn't agree with you more. It is a lovely country. Our next story in this section is about carry traders using the weakening euro to win in emerging markets. From what I understand, that it isn't always the case that the euro's weakness offers emerging market currencies a carry advantage. More often than not, weakness on one side coincides with losses in the other, leaving little scope for arbitrage. But this time around, the dollar surge is more harmful for the euro than to developing nation exchange rates. Craig, if I may start with you, from a treasury perspective, do you think funding carry trades by selling euro is an interesting option and will become more common or do you see this as a problem? I think generally it's a problem. I refer to Kevin Coldiron. I'm trying to remember the other person's name who wrote a book about, um, it wasn't called The Problem of Carry, but it, it talked about the carry issue broadly, both at the central bank level, as well as the individual level. So the idea that there's rate differentials between different economies, so borrowing in a currency that has a lower rate to use it in another area is sort of a natural arbitrage way of doing it. If you have those those opportunities and it's not speculative, that is what people do to a certain extent. Those that are doing it speculative, I mean, that's not a corporate treasury role to be speculative on the movements in currency rates, interest rates, and trying to take advantage of those. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a general situation that, you know, you're going, you're going to see an exacerbation of this volatility by, you know, speculators in the market. In addition to, you know, just natural, I can borrow in Japan cheaper than I can get funding in France or something. So, I mean, naturally there's going to be some of that if you have activity in both of those countries, but this is just more of the, the repercussions of this volatility we're seeing. The most worrying remark in this article, this piece, was a f- quote from Edouard de Longa, Longlade, the founder of a hedge fund. He's saying, Europe is on the brink of disaster and we could move to a place where the dollar is strong against everything. But similarly, the euro gets weak against everything. I worry whether we're you could include uh, the sterling in that last comment. But this shows the level of anxiety that is around in the foreign exchange markets. We're treading on dangerous ground, I feel. Treading on dangerous grounds. If I may ask you a follow-up question, do you think euro will remain an unloved currency struck under relentless pressure and continue to get weaker against other currencies? My feeling is it's gone as low as it's going to go, but a tip in the stability of the euro euro market in the EU, like, for example, Russia switching off the gas to Germany. Already there are rumours that the Norwegians are going to switch off exporting electricity to the UK. So we're at a very sensitive point. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I hope it isn't bad. Let's move to our forward to our next section, which is about payments. The U.S. National Automated Clearing House Association has reported an increase in same-day ACH and B2B payments, moving 7.5 billion payments in the second quarter of 2022, which has propelled the ACH network to second quarter profits. Craig, do you think this growth and the resulting profit is because the same D ACH dollar limit had been increased to US $1 million per payment this quarter following the increase in March of this year, or is it because of some other factors? Well, undoubtedly, that's a huge contributor to it. The expansion of the limits, increase in limits. We see that in different uh, countries on these newer, faster, better, more rapid payment schemes. Working, they start off low um, because of concerns about fraud. Uh, as adoption picks up, they keep increasing the limits. They find that they're secure. That allows for greater use, more frequent level of transfers. Uh, oftentimes, instead of doing a wire, they can do some of these types of uh, transfers for funding. And so, what we're seeing is a we're seeing a growth in overall payments, electronic payments, far faster than the economy. This is certainly the the case with uh, same day ACH. Certainly, when you look at the the growth in terms of the value of of transfers, it's uh, being able to do tenfold what you used to be able to do allows for uh, the value to go up uh, far faster than the volume. But uh, these are positive signs. The faster, better, more efficient payments 
uh, are picking up and we expect this to continue for some time. And more payment volume is why we're, there's a lot of the news articles that we're going to be discussing today is about the growth of payments, the move more towards digital, more towards quicker, more towards better information. And this is why companies are investing in this, uh, in the space of payments. From my perspective, from the UK, European perspective, this is a bit of a joke because the US is so far behind. We have had 20% growth per year for the last nearly 10 years in the UK on uh, instant payments. What it's done is transform the way we do business. So not only do we get more um, instant payments across Europe, we get things like in Holland, uh, the credit cards are hardly used because they just use instant payments between their bank accounts. You've only just started to grasp the scale of what's coming. I think there's much more to come. Our next story may have a connection and pertains to American Express introducing a digital cross-border payment solution for small businesses in the U.S. Small business customers can expect to send payments funded from their business bank accounts to their suppliers in more than 40 countries and in multiple currencies with potential to earn points on their foreign exchange payments. Craig, what do you make of this development? This is one of many of these types of solutions that helps smaller businesses take advantage of some of the tools that large companies have always had to uh, to be more global. Uh, this ongoing globalization of companies having trading partners, customers, they need to make payments in multiple currency across the globe. And there's been a significant amount of resistance and friction to doing that. Going to a typical bank portal, everything is opaque. It's like you can do a transfer, you plug it in, you can see a rate and then the, the fees, everything's embedded in that. You make a transfer and you have no idea what you're paying. The delay may be multiple days. Um, and so some of these tools like some of these tools and portals that allow you to make these payments, you get much better visibility to the rates, the timing, the information, and it tends to be cheaper. When you can see what's going on, you get a better rate. So this is, uh, I think this reducing friction is going to help the the middle-sized commercial client down to smaller businesses that have uh, global payments. And and this is an area of growth. As Jack said, you know, there's, there's more growth on the electronic front. There's also more growth on the cross-border. So another positive sign and a lot of companies are rushing to provide these types of solutions. Amex is just one of the three uh, card companies that are all doing this type of service. Um, they have discovered B2B and the smaller companies. It's just going to grow and grow. The issue is going to be for SMEs is which system do they choose? And that's where my impression is from a review of the three systems is that I like rather like the Amex system rather than the Visa and the MasterCard. But it's a particular personal and business choice. It's not a general factor, I feel. Jack, do you think we should um, stop referring to those companies as card companies and start referring to them as payment companies? Yes, absolutely. They were long... Long since uh, MasterCard doesn't, uh, apart from the title, doesn't mention cards at all. Um, Visa's better space because they've just got the Visa word. They've been at this for a long time. What surprises me is uh, how long they've taken. Moving to forward to the third section up for discussion today is bank and payment company activities. Toronto Dominion Bank or TD Bank is close to a deal to buy investment bank Cohen for US $1 billion, sources told the Wall Street Journal. We also have another acquisition story wherein Global Payments is set to acquire Evo for US $4 billion to help expand its B2B business. How do you think TD Bank will benefit from this acquisition? And if I may ask you another question with this, do you think acquiring Evo is a prudent strategic decision for Global Payments? 
Uh, that's a that's a lot of questions across a couple items, so I'll try to handle them uh, quickly. So TD Bank, the U.S. version of Toronto Dominion or the, the subsidiary, you know, has been expanding in the U.S. heavily, making very good progress from the consumer to the commercial side and to the lower ends of the corporate space. You know, they acquired First Horizon Bank. They continue to expand here. It's a huge, the U.S. is a massive market. This is an area of significant growth, so they're pouring a lot of money here, and it, that makes great sense. And then to expand into the uh, more heavily into the investment bank area is also logical. I mean, the, their balance sheet's bigger. They're a top 10 bank in terms of asset size in the U.S. They need to and will continue to build out their portfolio to as they continue to fill this position as one of the top 10 banks in the U.S. So these are natural. It's a lot easier to buy a platform and incorporate it than trying to build some of these things from scratch. So it's a logical expansion. We see banks focusing on areas of growth, and this is uh, one of the latest banks doing that. You know, it's clear to see what TD Bank is doing. With regards to global payments, acquiring Evo, does it make sense? Did they overpay? I don't know that I can make uh, qualifying statements on this other than to say that payments are growing very significantly. That's why we see MasterCard, Visa, American Express, invest in these areas. That's why we see banks investing in payment space so heavily. And so payment companies like Global Payments, will this seem like an overpayment in a few years in an era of very rapidly growing payments? I think it depends what you plug into your model. Will that be an overpayment if we continue to have 20, 30% growth? Where do you get that growth in other areas? So I think those are some of the factors that they're they're deciding on. But there's a lot of money floating around, sloshing around that's being directed at payments. This is another in this chain. I expect we'll see more payment activity, more payment uh, acquisitions. Yeah, my feeling is the, the general comment about these two stories is that scale makes a difference. Scale is, is essential for growth in maintaining and growing. The issue, though, is with company like Evo, they are in 12 countries Stripe, the really big competitor here whose turnover is worth more than City's turnover, is in 120 countries. And the number of products and services Stripe have is far greater than anywhere near Evo. So Craig's quite right that the issue is how do they grow it in a way that makes sense to their investors but also to the customers. Because when you look at the level of service you can get from and the number of products you can get from Stripe compared to Evo, I wonder how successful they're going to be, particularly when they try and move into new markets. The fourth section for today that merits discussion is about payment fraud and mobile security. The first story in this section is about the pressing need for the UK to address a massive problem as it faces the highest rate of bank card fraud in Europe. According to the SMF's analysis of European Central Bank data figures, there were 134 card frauds per thousand people in the UK in 2019. Card fraud cost the UK more than £8,800 per thousand people. The second story pertains to the Verizon Mobile Security Index 2022 report reveals that close to half of the companies surveyed suffered a security compromise involving a mobile device in the past 12 months that led to the loss of data, system downtime or other negative outcomes. Companies with a global presence were even more likely to have been affected by mobile compromise. More than 3 in 5 or 61% had been hit, compared to 43% of organizations with only a local presence. Jack, if I may start with you, when you hear of the proliferation in card frauds in the UK and that more companies are experiencing mobile or mobile-related security compromises, what are some of the most important security concerns and fraud prevention measures that come to your mind that you may like to share with the audience of CTM file? Sadly, UK is not only the capital of card fraud, it's the capital of money laundering as well. And it just shows that the disciplines of fraud control are just not here from doing things on a regular part of your philosophy 
to investing properly. For example, we had a, a new um, a function added to accounts in the UK, which offered the opportunity to people to move their money to the UK. And you didn't have to register who the owners, the constituents of the company were. It's the fastest growing type of money laundering in the world. It's an example of how the disciplines of being precise and covering all bases is absolutely essential. Look at Germany, how low their fraud is. It's a difference in culture, a difference in attitude. Sadly, I think the UK is just going to get worse. Eight pounds, 80 pence per person uh, fraud level in, in the UK. When I think about it in those terms, that doesn't seem massive, though that is quite a bit larger than like Italy, for example. It's um, less than a pound per person equivalent of fraud. You can see the stark difference between the UK and some of the other European areas on this fraud level. And this is a constant battle up and down. Jack, I appreciated your comments about the lack of KYC for opening these accounts. When the globe is tightening with KYC activities to hear that you can open up uh, corporate accounts without knowing the underlying people, that seems very anomalous to what we see in every other Western country, every other second world country. That's, that's why we are the capital of money laundering, no doubt about it. But what this, this shows is that looking between difference between countries like Germany and Sweden and the UK is that it has to be joined up thinking, not just the authorities, but also the politicians. So they are on the lookout for and integrate together. There are some very good attempts in the UK. For example, the action fraud team in the UK, very diligent and very good, but they're not getting the cooperation from the government and from the politicians who are not understanding what's needed. The report that pertains to Verizon's mobile mobile security index, which highlights that more organizations have been subject to a security incident involving a mobile device. And you also see that cybercrime is rising because of remote working, lack of security training, as well as lack of remote guidance. When you hear and read of this, what are your first thoughts? Well, a couple of things. Those that say uh, there wasn't a problem with uh, this remote work or work from home from a cyber threat, and cyber fraud perspective. We know that from all of the people and all of the data that comes in from those that know and should know that that has created a more vulnerable network. People are connecting their home networks versus the, the corporate network. That requires a dis- different level of uh, protection. You know, not everyone's coming in over a VPN in a secure manner in this uh, ongoing work from home environment. So this idea of mobile devices, whether they're bring your own device or other devices, is a major, major issue. You know, this this idea of what do criminals target? They target the weak spots. They look at every area. They target the weak spots. And if you look at this report, there's data. I think it was like a half a million. They did a survey of half a million phishing websites. Half a million websites set up for the purpose of capturing data. There's banks that have teams that go about looking for the phishing sites that can compromise their individual customers or their corporate or commercial clients. And they go about extinguishing those. And this is a, they use services that go about taking these down. The compromise of uh, mobile devices can occur through the QR codes. You know, if you want to be scared, it's like, okay, you know, Jack's going to make fun of uh, the fact that we have, uh, we haven't grown some of our electronic processes as much, but it's maybe we'll all go back to paper someday because it's hard to go. But, but this idea of the, the sheer volume of phishing websites and, and penetration makes sense because if I can compromise your phone, uh, that may have your dual factor authentication on it. They are targeting individuals and they're also doing broad sweeps on this criminals, very organized criminals, very automated. Uh, systematically gathering this information to compromise to get data uh, or to interfere in payment processes. So this mobile security index is not something you have to memorize as a treasury professional, but when you think about payment security and data security, treasurers, assistant treasurers, directors need to understand these points of vulnerabilities. Even if you don't understand all of the elements about it, 
this is another area that's the criminals are working very hard to compromise these. So things like when they you complain about your organization wants to put mobile device management on, puts a container on your phone to isolate it and protect it. That's no longer nice to have like it might have been five years ago, six years ago. That is essential for protecting that endpoint into corporate data, corporate communication. So I think we have to realize that we need to protect every endpoint and a mobile device is an endpoint. There's a marked difference between different organizations that I run across during my work. And lots of organizations like the big banks are now saying, okay, you can use your own device, bring your own device for certain things. But other things are just struck off. They're not available. And for those people, they provide the equipment and the software and everything. And it's under total control of the bank or the or the employer. It's very cheap compared to the cost of a major fraud outlet. Finally, I would like to wrap up this conversation by seeking your opinion on your choice for the biggest or most important story of the past week and why. Jack, if I may start with you. What's really been proven is the importance of scale, but focused scale, not just growing for the sake of it, but focused growth, focused resources, focused disciplines. It's the focus and scale. Yeah, in terms of a, a particular article, to me, the uh, the TD Bank acquisition, you know, the, the investment bank continuing to expand on the commercial side is part of an ongoing story about some of these major banks really focusing in, I guess, to tie into to Jack's word on scale and focus, but focusing in on uh, areas that complement and build out their brand. That's more important than some of the economic troubling items because we've highlighted that in, in the last few weeks. Fraud's an ongoing issue, but I, I'm going to have to point to the TD Bank deal as the most uh, significant story for this week. Wonderful. A very big thank you to you, Jack and Craig, and to our CTM file audience for joining us on this edition of Open Treasury. Please subscribe and look in the show notes for the article links. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. For more information, visit ctmfile.com.